that did that make them blink? Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, I'm Elmer Masters, the Director of Internet Development with Cali. Um, first of all, welcome to the conference. Um, how many people here, this, is this your first conference? Whoa. <laughs> well, hi and welcome. Um, we hope you come back again and again and again. Um, I've been here every year since 1994, so that's a long time. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, converting law reviews to ebooks, um, and uh, uh, I'm, it, it might get a little technical, but not too much because mostly we're just talking about converting. Um, we're just going to be talking about converting Word files into HTML. A law reviews still use Word, right? Or Word Perfect. No, please don't tell me any of them are still using Word Perfect. Okay, well, you can convert Word Perfect to HTML, too. You know, I thought it had gone away, but I guess it had. So, um, well, in this case, because I don't have Word, I don't have Word Perfect for the Mac, um, but I do have Word. You know, we'll be talking about converting Word processor files into HTML and then, um, and then doing stuff with that, so that's sort of the, the focus. So... Um, one of the, the, the goals here is to show you how to, to, to do this with, um, uh, without spending a lot of money um, because there are expensive ways to do it. There are services that will convert law reviews. Um, they'll convert the books into, uh, into uh, e-book formats and then, um, and then help you sell them on Amazon and, and, and in, in, in iBooks and, and such. But you can do it for free and then if you want to sell them on uh, on Amazon, you can. You can keep all the money for yourself that way. Or um, you could just, you know, give them away if you'd like. Um, you know, all that open access journal type stuff. Um, what we're going to be talking about today um, is we, with the, the target format for, uh, uh, that we're going to be looking at is called EPUB. And um, that's the format that's used by iBooks and... Um, uh, the Nook, and virtually every other reader and reader software out there, with one exception, that being the Kindle. The Kindle uses a different file format. Um, there is a nice free tool that will convert the EPUB files to a file that the Kindle will read, though. So you can, um, you can do that. And I'll mention that. 
just in passing here. Um, also, uh, once you've gotten stuff in EPUB, there are also other uh, tools for converting it into, into PDFs, but I think a lot of you are already converting uh, at least individual articles into PDF anyway. Um, we'll, be, we'll be using a tool called Sigil, um, which is a, you can think of it as a word processor that produces ebooks, sort of the, the, the easiest way to think about it. And it's actually not, it's not too scary to use. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It has a nice WYSIWYG interface and, and such. Um, and, and we'll take a quick look at the style sheet. And then we need to know about uh, some of the formats. And of course, you're going to need some word processor files at some point. Um, the EPUB format, um, we're doing a lot with EPUB. Okay, the, the, all of the, uh, the free law reporter ebooks that are on here, there are like 700 of them, um, are in the EPUB format, okay? Um, which means you can read them on iBooks, you can read them on the Nook, you can uh, uh, open them with uh, Adobe Digital Editions. There, there are a bunch of different readers. Um, I like working with it because it's just a zip archive. Um, so, so literally, all you need to do is zip up a certain set of files and change that .zip to .epub, and you're done. Um, and, and the files that are inside that zip archive um, are the actual text of the, of the book, and that is, uh, is typically, or has to be actually, valid XHTML. So it's just an HTML file. Um, and we, uh, and, and it parties like it's 1999, because it has to be old, simple XML, or uh, HTML, rather. Now, this really can't complicated, fancy, inline style stuff or anything like that. I mean, you can do it, but, um, but for the best results, it just likes nice, clean text. You can include images. You can do tables. It handles uh, footnotes. Um, you know, so you can, you can do the things that you need to do. Uh, but it doesn't have to be real fancy. You can, you can do things like set type faces, um, and you can actually include typefaces if you get into sort of more advanced stuff. So if your journal is using some odd font that they really like, um, if there's an electronic version of it, you can probably, you can probably include it. Um, besides the HTML files, there are a couple of XML files that, um, that basically act like a table of contents and a directory for, um, for the book. Uh, so, so what these other files do, which I'm not even going to mention by name because it just doesn't, you don't really need to work with them directly. Um, but what they do is they keep a list of the, uh, they keep a list of the, of the, of the chapters in a book uh, in whatever order they need to be in. And, um, and then another, there's another uh, uh, file that, that contains metadata information. Um, and it'll, it'll hold all kinds of, for the librarians in the room, all kinds of good double, Dublin Core stuff. So you can have a lot of metadata uh, right in the, um, in the package so that you can, um, you know, you can uh, get everything uh, well identified. Okay. So, and one of the great things about, about EPUB is, is that it actually is an open standard. Um, the, uh, they, have, they have their own website and everything. Um, but the, the, so, so they're, um, and we're currently working with, uh, with EPUB 2, um, which is sort of the current working standard. EPUB 3 um, will actually handle uh, HTML5 and things like audio and video. Um, but that's a year or so down the road. Um, and, you know, I don't know if anybody's planning video supplements for their law reviews. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, but, but EPUB's an open standard, so, so anybody can use it. And there's, there are a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, work and implementation around there. And it's not sort of locked down to any particular vendor. Okay. Um, vendors do use it. Um, and they've added their own encryption to the zip files. They've added DRM. They've done different things with it. 
um, to, 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 uh, to sort of make it their own. And that's fine. That's what open standards are for. But we can get in and do what we want to do with it also. Yeah. Yeah, I read the article, and, and, and the headline, it said everything in the headline. It said, at some point, they were planning on, but I haven't seen it yet. So, um, yeah, at the point, at some point, they'll probably, they'll probably have to, just because there's, a, there's just a lot of pressure for them to, to do that. And one of the reasons why is that they've been really stingy about letting people use their file format, which is actually just a slight modification of this. But... Um, yeah, Emily? You can use sigil that will you're going to mention. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, and also, there's another tool which I, uh, called Calibre, which, uh, I, I, which I'm not going to really mention a lot, which will actually convert between a whole bunch of different formats and the .mobi files that will work on Kindle and .epub and PDF. Um, but so I find it kind of difficult to work with. Um, also, it's more of a library management tool as opposed to an editor. It is. So let's take a quick look at Sigil. Um, and the, the links for these tools are on the, uh, the, the, session, uh, the session description. Um, Sigil's cross-platform, it, um, it will run on Windows and the Mac. If you happen to be using Linux, uh, it doesn't like 64-bit Linux. So any real geeks out there who are running 64-bit Linux on their quad-core laptops, yeah, you have to do something else. But... Um, but it, but it runs great on, on Mac and Windows. And, um, and basically, as you can see, there's, there's, really, not, there's really not a lot, a lot to it. So let's, um, let's open up, because I actually, I got I to gotta start on one so I can find. It would probably help if I know where I saved it to. I've had this problem with uh, Sigil before, where I've, like, blown stuff up. Uh, let me see here. Where did it go? Yeah. See, this is why you should never work late at night. Well, when all else fails, we'll do this. Um, basically, when you start, what you're going to do is you simply start adding um, HTML files. And we're actually going to add some of these HTML files. Now you see that um, this one turned up. And, whoops, let's add second one. Okay, so now I have, um, I have three. We can, we can open them up. So these are just, um, these are just three HTML files. Um, the, uh, the important thing to, uh, the important thing to know is, is that these started as, uh, well, these actually did start as WordPerfect files. I should actually say that. Not only are they WordPerfect files, they're WordPerfect files from 1999. So they're old WordPerfect files. Um, and I managed to get them into Word and then into here without actually destroying them. Um, so, uh, but, but basically, uh, from Word, I just did the, the basic HTML, like the, the, uh, the option that says just the display only, and that like leaves out all the funky style stuff and, and everything that, that's in it, and that just gives you the clean HTML. Because um, you want to start with the cleanest HTML you can, you can get. Um, Sigil will give you options for 
um, for, for tidying up. Hang on one second. I need to make a small change because I cannot see my... There we go. Okay. Um, Sigil has tools for cleaning up HTML. Um, so that you can use uh, clean, uh, you turn on cleaning with HTML tidy. And what that'll do is whenever you open an HTML file, it'll actually clean it up and like take out like unclosed tags and strange things that it doesn't like and, um, you know, and some stuff. And, and typically it doesn't have any effect on, um, uh, on pretty basic text. Um, it handles, um, it, it, uh, footnotes become, um, of course, when you convert them to HTML, they become endnotes. Okay. Now, what this has done is, there's a table of contents editor, and it will automatically generate the table of contents um, for a given, um, for the, uh, for the book um, as it's um, as it goes along, and that's based on the uh, the HTML uh, heading size tags H1, H2, H3 that you use when you're marking stuff up, and this is why style sheets are important. Um, you want to make sure that, uh, for example, a Word document has a set um, you know a set style to it that can be mapped to uh, HTML headings. Um, and uh, uh, as long as somebody's got that key that says to like, you know, 36 point whatever is, you know, is H1 and, you know, 24 point is H2. And, you know, so somebody can go, go through and, and, and do that markup. I mean, one of the things is, is that this is not a totally automated process um, when you're, you know, especially when you're dealing with stuff that's coming out of word processing. Um, so, so somebody will actually have to do this for each article. Um, but... Um, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, uh, not, you know, too, uh, too difficult. Um, and then as you can see, what it does, it actually adds, it automatically adds the H headings 2, 3, and 4 to a table of contents. Um, so that you end up with uh, the title of each article as an H2 um, creates a hierarchy so that that so that you can um, so that you have that um, you know that that H2 sort of thing there, um, and then when you're looking at um, you know uh, an H3 would be the next level, and then it has a couple levels under that. Now what this is going to do is when it when it builds the EPUB document, it will uh, create that table of contents for you, um, so you'll be able to um, to uh, 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 to follow it along when you when you look at the uh, when you look at the book. Now, if you don't want certain levels to be in the table of contents, you can take them out, um, and then that way, if you you know, so if you don't want those sort of sub subheadings to turn up in the table of contents itself, um, you can remove them. Now, it doesn't take them out of the document. The markup stays in the document. All it does is it removes them from the listing that's going to be the table of contents. Um, and then in this case, it actually then will short, you know, then it, it flattens out the table of contents. Okay, so now instead of having that multi-layer, you've got the title, and then you've just got sections. You don't have subsections. And then we can, we can click OK. Um, so this time, okay, now another thing that we can do is we can actually look at the code now, it's a WYSIWYG editor, so what you see is what you get. So you can type your HTML, and you've got, um, you know, you have control over some of the, uh, the basic HTML tags um, when you're in the, the book view, so that you can do things like uh, do underlines, um, do text alignment. Um, you can set the different heading sizes, okay? So that allows you to, 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 do, um, to do basic editing of the HTML files right here, um, if you've got stuff that possibly might need more severe cleanup, you can actually look at the actual HTML code 
and work with this. Um, not this is not a really good code editor for anybody who actually edits who likes to edit HTML directly. Don't use this. Um, if you you know if you if you're doing stuff at, at that level, um, you should probably be using a much better editor anyway. But if you need to jump in and just you know something weirds happened you know for some reason the um, uh, uh, you know all of the um, you know this, there there are like a couple extra paragraphs or something you can't quite find them. Um, you might want to, you know, you can you can open it up and, and pull them out of there. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and and save this. Um, oh, there it is. 6:40 a.m. and no wonder I was couldn't find it again. Um, so so we're going to save this, except this time we're going to put it where I want to sit, where I want it to go. Okay, so now I have that EPUB file, and So I saved the EPUB file, and then I can open that with. Um, we'll go for. Well, let's go with digital editions. Um, right now, we didn't do anything for. We didn't do any metadata or anything. So we we've got a lot of uh, a lot of open space here. We have author unknown. We don't have a cover, but we do have the articles. And. Um, and we do have that table of contents that we created, and and it will um, it will you know allow us to to flip through the uh, flip through the articles that way. Okay. So switch back to the reader view, um, but we can do a lot of metadata. Okay. Um, so we can give it uh, we can give we can give our, our uh, we can give it a title. Okay, and we can add additional metadata. So if you have an ISS, an, an ISSN, um, you can add that. Um, if you're uh, capturing publisher information, um, you can add that. Um, there's an advanced tab that gives you a lot more fields um, so that you can add, um, you can add additional things. Um, in here, and including stuff like copyright holder, and um, and creator, and cover designer, costume designer, because I know probably a lot of law reviews have costume designers, or at least maybe they should. Um, so uh, there's, but there are there are a whole uh, uh, a whole ma uh, all manner of of fields there that you can um, that you can add. I think there's a um, right, there's license or and licensee fields. So there's different things you can you can throw in here, and, and all of that, all that will turn up. Um, and then when you click OK, um, it basically saves uh, saves all of that. Okay. Um, now you notice that we we only have right now we just have the uh, the text. We're just adding stuff in the text folder. You'll see folders for styles, images, fonts, and miscellaneous. So you can actually add a style sheet. If your website has a style sheet that you're using, for example, um, you could put that in there and make calls to it. Um, if, you, if you have images, uh, you, know, you might have pictures in your law review. I know those are really popular. Um, or you might, have, you, might have some, you, know, you might have some graphics in the law review, maybe a masthead or different things like that that you want to include. Um, those would be, uh, would, uh, would be stored in images. If you're using a special font, you can include the font file, okay? Um, and then miscellaneous will hold uh, other things 
I'm not exactly sure what. It's supposed to hold, it's supposed to hold other things like cover images and stuff, but usually they just get put in the images folder anyway. Okay, and then all that stuff, um, all that stuff gets wrapped up, and we made that, we made that change, so now if we, um, if we go back to this, let me reopen this. Oh, there. There we go. Um, yeah, maybe not. Yeah, Adobe Digital Editions is not my favorite tool in the world. Works pretty well, though. Oh, sorry, wrong button. Let me try that one more time. Okay, so now, right, so now we have a title and we have an author there. Okay. Um, we have our table of contents. Um, there's a way to access, maybe, no, wait, that's not it. There's a way to access all the metadata in here, too. But, uh, let's see if I can find, oh, item info. So there's the item info. Um, that gives me the basic stuff, tells me how big it is. Um, you'll notice that permission set by publisher, because you can actually set DRM inside of these files that would say that, you know, would tell the uh, Adobe Digital Editions reader anyway to only read, you know, only let you read it on certain computers and stuff, but who wants to do that? Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Um, let's take a look at... Shrink that down. Hey, Elmer, yeah. Mm -hmm. You may have mentioned that uh, you have the two HTML files in there. Are they linked together once you export them? They're actually stored inside an archive. So, so you still have the you still have the the individual when you're editing them you're actually edi editing them inside the archive you're not editing the standalone files. So, um, uh, yeah, they're decoupled. It's essentially a copy of the original. So you only ha always have the original. So if you mess it up, you just scrap the thing and start over again. <laughs> Right, they'll they'll be they'll be in the order they'll be in the order that they appear on um, in uh, in sigil. So um, they're like that, and I think I can do yeah, I can pick them up and move them. Okay. And this one's blank at the moment. But we can move it around. Oh, uh, this one? Yeah. No, that's actually just a, that's actually just the default one that it opens up with. Um, so uh, that's just that. That's just the way that the program works. It doesn't do anything. That's why your first page was blank. It's displaying that. Yeah, it's displaying that. I didn't take it out. I should have taken it out. Um, but yeah, and you can you can rearrange them like this. Now the other thing that you can do is that you can take um, you can take HTML from like anywhere um, and uh, and put it in here. Um, so uh, for example, we could do something like. Let's see if I can find this real quick. Um, it's in here. No, it's up there. No, I probably can't find it real quick. I might be able to. For oh, I don't know where it went. It's bouncing around there somewhere. Oh, here we go. There's a copy. Okay, so this is this is the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. 
So I took this off of the GPO site, maybe, I forget exactly, as a series of HTML files and, um, and hand converted them, essentially, to fit here. So the title page, which we didn't really look at title pages, but the title page um, you would want, this is uh, H1, you know, the, the heading one size, and that should really only appear once in the book. And if you put it on the beginning at the top of a page, it'll, it'll use that as, as essentially as the title um, of the book. Um, and, and, it'll, and you can designate this then as the, um, uh, as the, uh, as the title page. Um, because we can add semantics to a given page. So I, I designated this one as a cover. Okay? So if you're doing any of these other things, you can note those and, and it'll, it'll save that. It'll also save that additional metadata in the, in the XML files that come with the, um, that come with the whole thing. Okay? Um, and then each, uh, each section then of the federal rules becomes there we go oh well, let's get to the where are we oh there's title one okay so so it went through and and then we've got title one is heading two and then we go through and and what we end up with is a um, is a table of contents for this particular book that looks like this. Um, and this is actually set up to mimic the actual table of contents on the uh, uh, PDF version that's uh, signed from the GPO. Okay, so all this, um, all this gets put together that way. Um, the other thing that we can, uh, that we can, um, we can demonstrate here is, is that this includes um, this includes forms and footnotes. So the footnotes in, in here are actually in a separate file. Um, so all the footnotes are in a separate uh, are in a separate file, and there aren't too many of them. This is the unannotated version, so there, there aren't there aren't a lot of a lot of footnotes. But they're they're in a they're in a separate they're in a separate file, and the links go to those. And then this is whoops, not the admiralty rules, the forms. Okay. Um, and the forms are represented as a series of scanned images. So they're linked from the images folder on the side. Okay. So so this this holds all of this stuff, and it's all and it's all been marked up so that it all it all looks um, it all looks really nice. You can actually download a copy of this at the Legal Education Commons website. Um, it's available for for download, I think. Yeah. Um, also. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because I was starting with, um, I had actually I had to go in and, and hand edit um, a lot of it because even though I was starting with HTML, when I pulled it out of the structure that it was already in, um, it was you know it had to be relinked. So it, it took it took a few days um, to do. Um, but if you're dealing with something like a law review where you've got, um, you know, uh, individual articles that probably exist as individual files and they don't really link together anyway, um, you're not going to need to go through, you know, quite so much um, as this. Now, the, the thing that will happen is, is that, like, all that table of contents information, for example, all gets, is all generated automatically and, and you've got then, you don't have to worry about linking, um, you know, uh, the table of content, you know, the title to the title, the section to the section in the article, all that will just be done by sigil and it will be included in the EPUB um, once, it, uh, once it comes out the, uh, comes out the other side. Okay. Um, and the, the, other, the other big thing that, that uh, you know, that, that, you really, uh, that you really need to be able to do is, um, is work with uh, getting the documents into, you know, kind of a standard format, right? Um, so I actually went, um, this one's actually been, uh, been worked over a little bit. 
Um, but there's a, uh, you know, we've, we've developed the style sheet because we're, we're, we're doing e-books um, with the E. Langdell project. So I've actually developed the style sheet for the E. Langdell authors to use um, to mark up Word documents, you know, certain styles for chapter headings and, and all the rest of that sort of stuff. Um, and that's linked from the, uh, from the session page if you want to take a look at that because that's like a good start for what you might want to do with, with style sheets um, in sort of the, you know, not the web sort of style sheet but like a Word style sheet, uh, you know, templating sort of thing. Because um, I know law reviews are doing, law reviews do a lot of that stuff anyway to get it ready for, for publication. Um, so a lot of it might be a matter of just simply mapping, um, you know, to know that, you know, the titles need to be H2 and, um, you know, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, for a law journal, for example, you could create a title page, um, you know, that doesn't really need to change that much from one issue to the next and just reuse that HTML file, for example. Okay. Um, you know, and then once you've, you know, once you've sort of gotten to the end and you have the EPUB file, um, there is a, um, there's a, a program called MobyGen, which will generate something that'll, that'll live on the Kindle. Um, now, you know, you can, uh, but once you've, once you've done this, um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of things that, that, that actually might be useful. First of all, you've converted all those law review articles to HTML, which would be handy because then they could actually be on the web instead of just PDF files. That'd make me happy anyway. Um, and, and, then, and then you've also got the EPUB, which now can be read on a lot of different devices, and it has that, um, you know, you can get it to look uh, pretty close to the way uh, the print journal looks. Um, you know, with, uh, with the, uh, you know, um, you know, with, and it'll, um, the one thing, the one thing that, that it's really not, uh, or at least I won't get into, because it actually makes the whole process harder, is if you want to do something like force page breaks, um, which in theory you can do, but you really shouldn't, um, because it plays havoc with when people adjust the, the font uh, size, for example, in, in the reader. I mean, one of the things about converting things, about putting things in, in an ebook format, is um, that uh, you really have to be able to let go of sort of the rigid structure um, of the document. Uh, you know, if, you know if, if you take great pride in having one and seven, you know, one and, and three eighths inch margins all the way around, um, you know, with, you know, hanging indents and nice footnotes at the bottom with a funky little squirrely things, uh, you know, separating the text from the footnotes and, and every page has to, you know, look really nice like that, you're going to hate ebooks. Um, because ebooks, the, the thing about ebooks is, is that it takes text and it makes it just flow, right? So the idea is, is that, because what's important is the content, not the way it looks. Um, you can make it look pretty good. I mean, there's, um, there are some sites, um, you know, that, that have examples of great design in e-books that are just using plain HTML, and they make them look really good, and, you know, and, but they're also really functional, and they take into account things like, you know, people can make the font bigger or smaller, um, because as soon as somebody does that, then, you know, if you've set everything to be at a certain size and then somebody triples the size of the font, then, you know, everything's just broken. I mean, people can do that on the web now, but they don't too much. Or at least they stopped complaining to me about it. Well, because some of our websites are like that, right? If you make the font too big, you break the website. Stuff doesn't lay out right and, and things move around. Um, they usually, uh, I've only ever looked at one, and, and I don't remember what they did with footnotes.
yeah, and, and, and these are all, this does endnotes with links, essentially. But there's a difference between, like, SSRN is PDFs. And then, yeah, but, but that's, actually, that's actually a really big difference, though, because if I have a Word document, I can convert that into, um, you know, into HTML really easily and keep the footnotes, they become endnotes um, without, without any real problem. Um, uh, you know. Yeah, then, right, and right, because with PDF, there's no, there's no markup in PDF that says this number one is linked to this footnote down here. And so whenever there's any conversion, um, some of the conversion stuff tries to guess, but it, as often as not, it gets it wrong, which is why I don't like um, PDFs. And I don't, uh, you know, I think that, that simply putting a PDF on the Internet and going, look, it's like open ac access. It's like not really. Um, you know, it is because people can get it and it's easy for people to read. But if you want to do anything with it, like index it or analyze it, um, you know, it's really hard to work with those, with those PDFs for that. And especially with legal stuff because of things like footnotes. In, in terms of the legal content, though, uh, have you found a good solution for situations where somebody has a citation that includes a page number and being able to include that page number structure within the EPUB if you can't use pagination? Do you mean like in being able to like jump to something or? Yeah, if, the, if the citation was for pages you know, in a particular journal. Like oh, okay, yeah, how to cite something? Yeah. Now that's a whole other problem. Okay. Yeah, because you lose your page numbers, right? This is the universal citation problem applied to law reviews, right? Because what you should be doing is you should put an anchor numbers on every paragraph in your law review article so that that's how they get cited. Because the problem is, is that, yeah, this, this is a pageless system. So, um, so you, know, uh, uh, you know, page you know, 312, the Harvard Law Review, no longer exists. Um, now, you can put that data in. Um, you know, you can, include the, you can include the page data in, um, you know, uh, as you're doing conversions and stuff. Um, you know, but... Uh, but a cleaner way would be to do something like paragraph numbering, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, and, and that's, a, that's a whole other, that's a whole other, you know, it's a whole other problem. I mean, that's one reason why PDFs are preferred in this situation is because they keep that page structure so that people can cite to things. But, you know, you're, you're essentially keeping that, um, you know, keeping that sort of artificial structure you know, for those for those pages, you know, by by doing that, because I've seen, um, you know, a lot of law reviews when you when you grab an article for the uh, for the PDF, their number the the PDF pages are numbered according to the journal volume page numbers, so that they correspond to to what's in print. So you know, so that and and then of course that does make it you know that does make it easy to cite. Um, but yeah, another yeah, if you were gonna if you were going to do this and you were serious about it, you would want to start doing things like putting, doing, moving to a paragraph numbering citation system um, that's you know, sort of you know, easier to deal with. Yes, Rich. Right, and when you pump up that font size, it flows nicely. So it isn't like when you pump up the font size. I know you can increase the font. Uh, you, can, you can zoom in on a PDF, which is nice if you like moving your screen across the thing. But, um, but on, on an actual ebook reader, what you end up with is, is it actually just makes it bigger and it flows the text. And so you effectively end up with, you know, it just you know, has more screens. But it keeps the, it keeps the flow of the document intact.
Well, yeah, with right with PDFs. I mean, if you've got a large collection of PDFs and and, and the money, the, the easiest way to deal with them is, and you don't have the original files, is to just have them rekeyed. You know, send them out, and it costs you about a buck a page. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> um, but but that's one of the things about PDFs. I mean, you can't. You know, I mean the the other thing about the other thing about the uh, uh, you know uh, about these um, about these EPUB files is that I can let's see if it'll let me do it. No wait, I have to do it. Oh well, you have to take my word for it. Oh wait, I might have one. You can just unzip it. So you take the EPUB file. You get an EPUB file. And you can just unzip it. You run it through an unzip, which in, on the Mac isn't as easy as it should be. Um, but but you, can just, you can just unzip it, and then you have all the HTML files. So it's, a, it's essentially like a website in a box, almost. You know, you could really just take that EPUB file, unzip it, and, and put, the, uh, put, put the, uh, the files on the, you know, right, on the, uh, right on the Internet. And so you don't run into that problem of, like, I've got a pile of PDFs. What am I going to do with them? Because if you have a pile of EPUBs, well, you can do things with that too. I mean, it's then also easy to sort of you know mix and match those things also. So. Can, you limit, can you limit the use? I mean, uh, the, the nice thing about a PDF is you um, protect the content in a way that people can't just lift it. <coughs> uh, you could, because there are ways to put to add DRM to. Um, to to uh, to EPUB files, Adobe will be more than happy to sell them to you for thousands of dollars. So yes, you can you can you can add that. You can get that kind of security if if you're looking for if you if you're looking for that sort of um, that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, just like you know, you can you can put that kind of security on on a on a PDF. But if somebody wants to retype it, it's the analog hole. There's an analog hole. If there's anything digital. There's an analog hole. Somebody can just copy it out anyway. Yes? So we have four journals at our school. Mm -hmm. And our journals have decided to get together and create a new journal. And this journal, it's not that we don't have enough journals already, but we're going to have uh, just an online ver uh, journal mm -hmm. um, that the four journals are going to contribute to. And one of the ideas that they have is that they, um, not just having new content, but having enhanced content that comes out of their print journal. So, I'm wondering if, uh, can you add multimedia to these articles here? Like if they have an article they want to republish in their on online journal, they want to enhance it maybe with a podcast or a video of the author or things like that. Not this year. Um, the, the EPUB 2 standard doesn't support multimedia beyond uh, images. Um, the EPUB 3 standard um, supports all of the audio and video stuff that um, HTML5 does. Um, now, obviously, that's a pretty significant change in the technology um, than the, that you need. Um, you know, for right now, if they're just doing, if, if they have that idea, um, you know, their best bet is probably to just keep it in the web browser and keep it online for right now. You know, um, and just do it in, you know, just do it in a way that doesn't use Flash, so that it'll work on the iPad. Um, you know, and that's, you know, and that's that's perfectly doable. Um, and then that way they can, um, you know, they can do it. I mean, the the e, you know, EPUB isn't, um, you know, EPUB isn't sort of the only answer here for a lot of these things too. Um, you know, if your journal's putting. Um, you know, if your journal's putting their, you know, putting all their stuff on, uh, you know, on the on the web, you know, as HTML, for example, you know, or even if it's all up in PDF, um, you know, the, you know, they can they can get at it, you know. But the thing is, is that you know, if they want to do something that's sort of, you know, fancy, cutting edge, 
Yeah. I mean, I don't know how many people pay four ninety nine for a volume of some law review off of the Amazon bookstore, but. <laughs> Yes. Right, and and then those yeah, and those platforms are starting to come out. The magazine publisher Condé Nast does Wired and GQ and Gourmet, yeah, it's odd combinations of magazines. But um, the the they've the. Uh, They've developed a platform that they're going to start licensing um, because they, you know that they needed to they they wanted to be able to do you know online editions of their magazines, but they wanted it you know they've they've, they've kind of asked publishers like two hundred titles or something silly like that, and they didn't want to recreate it for each one. They went, we want a platform that we can use, and then once it works across our two hundred magazines, then we'll sell it to other people, and you know. Um, and they can have fabulous online magazines too. So there's, you know, there, there are other, um, you know, there are other solutions other than just EPUB, especially once you start getting into multimedia. And a lot of those, you know, are in are based on, um, you know, or a lot of them are just the the simpler ones are just using HTML5. So it all runs in a browser, and it just doesn't make too much difference what you know where you're running your browser from. You know, if it's an iPad or uh, you know a laptop or you know an Android phone or whatever, this stuff will just work. Any idea how this works with Chinese language set, character sets? No, not at all. <laughs> I have um, one journal that publishes, I think Mandarin. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure where. Um, yeah, you could you could probably find. I have absolutely no idea. Um, uh, I know that I know that the um, the uh, the EPUB the EPUB two standards only a few years old, so it might actually deal with with localization stuff. Um, but on the other hand, XHTML is from 1999 and is notoriously bad at that sort of stuff. So I don't I don't know where I don't know what the uh, what the answer to that question is. Yes, Don. Oh well. Oh, okay. All right. <coughs> Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, John. Yeah, we had answered the essential question. Should you put your law reviews into an e book format? I think. I think that you should. I think that you. I think that. I think that you should have your law review articles available as HTML on the web, for starters, and then you can build EPUB based on that. Um, I think that it's another channel for distribution of them that's probably <coughs> worth exploring. Um, it, it does, um, you know, if because one of the things that happens obviously. If you if if you have a, if you have a print law review, libraries collect them. How many libraries collect uh, print law reviews? None. They all quit. Did they stop? Did they? No, right. They're still doing it. People are shy about it. Yeah, we still have some subscriptions. Well, the thing is, is that if you if if you still want to have your stuff collected, then one way to do that would be to put them in EPUB volumes, for example, which could then be sent to subscribers. Right? Here's here's volume seven, book three. Of you know, our law school's law review, right? Because um, that's one thing you don't get on the web, right? If it's just something that's just web-based, right? You have to have people have to come to your website 
and you sort of don't have anything to give them. They can read it there, you know, and uh, or if you have PDFs. Um, I don't know if any do do any anybody who who puts the PDFs on their website. You don't distribute whole issues as PDF files, do you? I don't. Hmm. Right. Oh, okay. Inside a PDF? <laughs> okay, well, see, then there's another really good reason to have them, you know, to, to, to at least break them up and, and, to, and to put them in HTML. You know, um, so does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Just quit using PDF. That's my. <laughs> you can tweet that. Tweet. Elmer says, "Quit using PDF for pretty much like anything," and then and then and then he'll be he'll be a lot happier. Yeah. PDF hater. That's right. I can get that on a license plate or something. I suppose. <sighs> Although we do convert like uh, Elang Dell stuff into PDF anyway. But yes. Because some people, you know, you still have to do things. Any other questions, comments? Yes. yes. This is real practical. What's, uh, what do you think is the cleanest uh, save out of work for, uh, for getting footnotes and everything like that? Um, I've had a lot of success with, if, if you do the, the save it as a, as a, a single web page, and then there's a, um, there's a, there's a selection on the Mac, I'm not sure because I know things that I, know, I do know things differ a little bit from one uh, from one thing to another. But um, right, so save as a web page, and then uh, the save only display information into HTML actually gives you pretty clean HTML. Um, leaves out a lot of the, a lot of the re weird word stuff. Um, if you do, and, and, it, and it will, it will save, uh, it will save your, uh, uh, save your footnotes as, um, uh, as in notes. That's awesome. Thank you. Yep. Of course, it actually works a little bit better if you convert the footnotes to end notes first. But, yeah. Um, and, and I know that that, let's see, wait, does that work? That worked really well in. Did that work? It worked really well in Word, but not in Word Perfect, or did it work really well in Word Perfect, but not in Word? One of those. <laughs> um, but it's actually, it's actually been, it's actually been better. So, um, but we actually have with with our Elang Dell stuff, we're we're supposed to be asking authors to do endnotes instead of footnotes. Um, because we're we're trying to break that whole page thing. How's that going, Deb? Ha, ha, ha.